unified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Death. There we go. So hi there. Thank you for hi. joining us today. Hi, Theo. I'm Della Rucker. I am the principal of the Wise Economy Workshop and content partner to the American Independent Business Alliance. And I'm delighted today to be able to talk to Theodora Scadis, who is the executive director of the of Cambridge Local First, which is an independent business alliance based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And we're talking today about a really intriguing initiative that Cambridge Local First has decided to take on, despite the fact, and perhaps because of the fact, that this is not an organization that has exhaustive resources. So I thought it would be really fascinating today to get a chance to talk with Theo about what this new initiative is and why and how this very small local organization is making this happen. So Theo, thank you so much. I really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, you are an extraordinarily busy woman. You are also now running for council in Cambridge. So, um, you know, it, it, it amazes me sometimes that you can um, find time to sit down and chat with me. But, uh, but thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show, Della. It's nice to be here. Great. So, um, or should I go ahead? Yeah, if you want to. Why don't you start by telling us a little bit about, uh, particularly about, Cam let's start by talking about Cambridge Local first. Mm -hmm. So just, just for people who um, aren't familiar with IBAs, let's give them a high level of, okay. of what your mission is, but also mm -hmm. if we could give them a little bit of a picture of what the organization looks like as an organization so that they realize that this is not a, you know, a 50 person staff operation. Yeah, that sounds good. And is it helpful? Um, there are like resources that I can share as well. Um, so I'm happy to screen share if you want, if you think that's helpful. Uh, okay. Let's talk for today and yeah, then we can sure. share. We'll so when this is posted, mm -hmm. we'll put the resources in the comments. Um, okay. I think that'll that'll uh, that'll work well. Go ahead. Sounds great. Okay. So um, yeah. So Cambridge Local First is an independent business alliance. That means that we are a collective of locally and independently owned businesses, as well as some nonprofits in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We have about 500 members, which means we have approximately 450 business members, maybe 25 nonprofit members and 25 community members. So we've also opened up membership to community members in the last year. And our members receive uh, three kinds of services from us. So we have a three pronged value proposition. Uh, the first prong is business services. So we provide technical assistance, trainings, connections. Uh, we have a membership directory for the public. We have all kinds of services that we offer businesses. Whenever they reach out and they have a question, we try to try to support them um, in whatever it is that they need. So if they need you know, facilitation resources because they're having a hard time negotiating a lease with their landlord, we can connect them to resources. Um, if they want help you know, improving their SEO, search engine optimization for their website, we have somebody who can help them do that. Um, so that's the first prong of our value proposition. And the second prong is that we do education to the public on why they should shop locally. The public, the, the consumers are a big piece of this puzzle. And um, without consumers um, informed on why they should be shopping locally, as opposed to going to uh, Target or Starbucks or Amazon, um, we, we spend a lot of our, our resources educating the public through before COVID in-person activities, um, now virtual activities we present at neighborhood association meetings. We um, do seminars to the public. We have a bi-weekly community conversation series. And we also do a, a huge amount of social media uh, education efforts across our Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter channels. And then the third piece of this puzzle is that we do policy work. 
Um, but historically, we haven't done as much. Um, we've really emphasized the first two and we, we haven't really invested in the third. So the third, what we've attempted to do is to support city councilors when they're creating policy orders um, that affect small businesses and, and serving as a resource to the city, whether it's uh, city staff or city council, um, when they have questions that affect small businesses. But historically, again, it hasn't been um, a huge part of our work. And to give you a sense of our size, so um, for the longest time, we've just been one staff member. We did just bring on a second staff member, an associate director to help manage our programming and partnerships. Um, so we're two people, um, although both of us is actually part-time. Um, so we, we do a lot in the time that's allotted to us, but collectively we're approximately one to one and a half full-time uh, employees, FTEs. So we don't have a huge amount of financial resources. The reason that we're not full-time is that we're pretty limited in our financial resources. But what we have um, really tapped into is the incredible network of people that exist in Cambridge. So during COVID, we probably worked with 100 volunteers over the course of the year, especially in spring 2020. And um, we now have uh, an internship program that we are really excited to be participating in called the Resilient Local Economies Internship Program. So that is a program, program offered in partnership with the Sustainable Business Network of Massachusetts, which is a statewide independent business alliance, and then the American Independent Business Alliance, which is national. So in the summer, and then again in the fall, and now in the spring, we have 15 interns who are working with us to support local businesses at the local, state, and national levels concurrently. So we have incredible partnerships with these organizations, these interns, and, and NGOs, nonprofits that are in Cambridge um, and, and elsewhere too. Um, and so we rely heavily on our partnerships to help implement the work that we're doing. So that's a little bit of context about us, our value proposition. And then last, I can I can describe how we're transitioning to um, greater um, activity in the policy space. So um, the idea arose in December when, um, through a series of conversations with my board chair, who is also my running partner, I realized that, um, or we realized, really, Susan um, realized that the approach that we've taken to date is somewhat piecemeal. Um, supporting independent businesses is an incredible thing to be doing, but it's only supporting one business at a time. It's kind of like the analogy of the boy who's walking down the beach and throws the starfish back into the water. Um, it's not systemic. It's not a rising tide that lifts all boats. It's um, individual interventions that support individual organizations. And so the hope is that we can really amplify our policy work because it's it's systemic. It's These are interventions that lift all boats. And so what we're trying to do is a, it's a multifaceted approach. We're trying to work with the city of Cambridge to create a survey to understand what the needs are that businesses have. We've done a literature review and we've identified a series of objectives and actions that fall under each of those objectives that are policy focused. And what we wanna do is collect feedback from businesses about what policies would be most meaningful to them. Once we're armed with the information that um, the survey will provide us, we wanna work more closely with city councilors to identify how to implement these policies in the Cambridge context. Already, We've set up recurring monthly meetings where we're meeting now with city councilors. We just started with our first meeting a few weeks ago, um, actually last week. And um, we're, we're setting up recurring meetings to, um, to be more proactive with them um, in voicing the needs of small businesses. Because historically what has happened is they'll reach out to us once a policy order is created. But at that point, it's a little bit too late for us to give substantive feedback because it's already been made public. And once a policy order is made public, it's harder to give feedback and make those changes because it's a public process. Um, and so there are more eyes watching the process. And so the idea is that we want to be proactive and, and have influence in the construction of the policy orders before they're created. And then the second piece is that it's not just the city council that is um, impactful in this space. It's also the city administration. So there are all these departments um, that heavily impact um, the experience of small businesses and their ability mm -hmm. to succeed. And so we also want to partner this approach with greater engagement and communication with um, city staff. So um, we've also set up a recurring meeting with the assistant to the city manager uh, because we have a strong city manager model. Um, the city manager is ultimately the one who makes decisions, not city councils, the city councilors or the mayor. Um, so we're also trying to build those relationships.
Okay, I'll pause there. No, that's fabulous, fabulous. Yeah. So, so you said something a minute ago that was like, like you know, music to my ears, which, which was that part of what was driving this was a realization that reactive response wasn't making the impact that the organization was looking for. And the second piece being that one-off services to individual businesses had a role, but it was not creating the the context. And, you know, like it, it doesn't matter whether you're an I at a certain level, it doesn't matter whether you're an IBA or you're a city economic development director, you're never going to have enough resources, enough human power, enough time to be able to provide, you know, one-on-one -on -one help to every single business in the community. You probably don't even have enough to add to do that for everybody if everybody asked. You have 400, you said 450 business members. Mm -hmm. If they all started yeah. asking you for help, you'd, you'd be up a creek. Um, yeah. So... Right. So, so that perception that the the response that a, a a portion of the response needed to be systemic, I thought, mm -hmm. is is incredibly insightful, and all the more so, given the the constrained resources that mm -hmm. your organization has. Um, so, I want to dig a little bit more into the question um, of 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 how you're you're starting this process so let's let's talk about the interaction with council first of all now you see it appears at least as an outsider that you've had a very positive relationship with your city council by and large they're never all sunshine and roses but that you've had a really uh, it, it's not a confrontational relationship as we see it sometimes in communities where where and i'm sure there are areas or or kind of sectors of cambridge where you know that relationship is more confrontational but or issues or whatever um but when it comes to to dealing you you've already got a good relationship with them how did did the council feel about the organization stepping forward and saying, we want to play a more proactive role with you. We want to do this survey and we want it to come out from the city, not from us. What was what was council's um, reaction to that? Yeah, well, it's an ongoing process. It's very much in the works. So some of it is, <laughs> is to be determined because, um, for example, I'm hoping to speak with our um, assistant to the city manager about the survey later today. So I'll keep you posted on that piece. Um, I would say, so part of the why we have such good relationships with city councilors is that um, myself, our board members, our members have been very active members of the community for a long time. So we're not um, new to this ecosystem. We are long stand, standing, standing players. For example, I actually um, managed the city council campaign of the woman who is now our mayor when she ran for her first city council, um, yeah, candidacy in 2017. So she and I have a very good relationship because I helped get her elected. Um, so she's someone that she, you know, I know I can call because I managed her campaign um, when it when it really mattered. Um, similarly, uh, some city councilors were past nonprofit executive directors who worked closely with our organization in the past. Um, Patty Nolan was board chair to the Sustainable Business Network of Massachusetts for many years. Um, I think Quinton Zondervan was executive director of Green Cambridge and also a co-founder of Climate Action Business Association and Climate Exchange, which are two statewide organizations in Massachusetts alongside Susan LaVandebar, our board chair. So the people who are on city council are not novel players. They, they Many of them have been integrated into this network for, for decades, actually much longer than I have been. Um, so so that's part of why we have a good relationship. Um, and we're also blessed with city councilors who are, by and large, very informed, proactive, and well-intended. Um, I think they the idea of our becoming more vocal in this space has been met with relief and and um, gratitude, actually, because it's it doesn't serve anyone 
for city councilors to create policies without a good consultation process. Um, they do it only because they, I think, are pressed for time and, and don't realize that we are here to support them. But when they, when they make policies in haste, our businesses push back um, if they're policies that are, are harmful to their interests. And so by working more closely together before policies are made public, we can actually um, make their jobs easier because then on Mondays or in advance of a Monday city council meeting, they're not getting dozens of phone calls from constituents complaining about policies. Their, um, their, their policies will be more successful. They'll be approved at a, you know, at a larger rate and, and they'll be more supported by the community. So it's actually a process that will support them just as much as it will support us. Um, oopsie, as to the, um, the city, city staff, um, those are relationships that we're building um, from a newer place. And so those are relationships that are taking longer to build, but we've made a lot of progress in the last year and I'm seeing growth and, and movement um, with each passing month. So I, I think that they will be receptive. It's just a, a longer process. The part of what you're, what you've done in mm -hmm. both the, the, on the, on the elected official side and now on the, the uh, the staff side or the yeah. the the appointed official side is yeah. that you're kind of forcing a change in the paradigm. You are, yeah. you know, yeah. for city council members, um, historically we've had a model where people are expected to sort of invent policy and then bring it to the public for for some kind of blessing, and increasingly as people are more and more um, deeply informed, not always well informed, but but certainly in a lot of cases much more knowledgeable or opinionated about mm -hmm. what's going on in their community, and especially yeah. in a place like Cambridge, where yeah. you know you you have some, you know, working with university cities is university towns is, you know, I always found to be a little bit of a a tough challenge as a consultant working with Cambridge with Harvard, MIT, and everybody else is like, I know, oh my don't bring yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. But the, the public policy process that we have so often set up is precisely what you describe. And being able to give those, those elected officials some help, you know, before it gets out into the public arena so that it goes forward with some public support, I think is a really, really brilliant way to get at that question. For the for the appointed officials and staff, uh, it's also a paradigm shakeup to have you guys coming in and saying, we wanna be help to this process. And again, it's, it's a structure that we've built up that so often is problematic. So, I want to dig a little bit into one of the other things that, that you said, um, which you talked about the literature review. And that's a that's a very good Cambridge way of saying it. Uh, <laughs> in the rest of the country, we would probably, not all the rest of the country, but for a lot of us, we would call that, mm -hmm. you know, research best practices, you know, things like that. But having that doing that research if everybody wants to say i'm a special unicorn and we're just going to have our own things that we do what has that research process looked like and has it have you had any um insights from it to date yeah it's a great question so um the research process, um, or what we call the literature review <laughs> in Cambridge, um, has, has been pretty um, No, it's okay. <laughs> um, can, you, can you hear me okay? The connection. Oh, absolutely. Job. Okay, great. Um, so the literature review, or, yeah, the research process um, is, is ongoing. Um, we pulled insights from two primary sources. Um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and Michael Schumann. Um, so for those who don't know, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance operates as a think tank in this space. Um, they are a national organization headquartered in Portland, Maine. 
that um, is co-managed by Stacey Mitchell, who's become a very vocal advocate for local businesses and really um, anti-monopoly efforts. Um, and, she, and she's brought together independent business alliance executive directors from around the country. And we're now participating in a policy process at the, at the federal level. So she's a real visionary um, and the work that she's doing we are trying to bring to the local level. So ILSR, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, has a series of recommendations. Uh, and Michael Schumann, who is another prominent thinker in this space, a professor and a real advocate, a multi-decade advocate for small businesses, um, is also um, ha has recommended many, many policies. And so what we've done is consolidated their policies and streamlined some of them um, for a Cambridge context. So we have a whole series of recommendations around what, um, what makes sense for the Cambridge context. And what we're hoping to do is put these into a survey that is then shared with small businesses around the city. That's a challenge because then you've got to give them enough of an explanation of those policies that they can, they can respond. Um, and, and, so, so that is still in development, from what I get. Yes, yes, it's okay. a, it's in development. Mm -hmm. Okay, beautiful. Yeah. Um, are there policies that, and and I know this is getting cart ahead of horse a little bit, but mm -hmm. you're you're very knowledgeable in this space. You you've you've had help from include from volunteers, including some of the resilient local economy interns. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to, to that in just a minute, because I think that's a, first of all, that's something we want to offer to, to the other IBAs. But that's also, um, I think, a, an, a great example of how you have leveraged resources far beyond the human hours that you have available on your payroll. Uh, but before we get there, are there policies that you have come across in that research that you're like particularly going like oh come on come on come on come on come on guys like this one like this one let's do this one yeah absolutely um so providing quick re relief to keep businesses afloat um and i know that the um the federal uh package that was just approved mm -hmm. um and will be shared with cities over the coming weeks is a really good example of this um but as we've forced businesses to close, they're not able to take in revenue. Um, and so if we're requiring them to shut their doors or to have diminished capacity, it really needs to be complemented with a um, a series of financial um, support that allow them to stay afloat. Otherwise, they won't make it. And, and that's part of why, as of November 2020, 37% of the small businesses in Massachusetts had closed. Um, permanently, 30, as 37. I think so. That's what a report um, that was published by a group of Harvard researchers said. I can share it with you. Um, yeah, a huge number of businesses were forced to close their doors um, because they didn't receive the support that they need. And so, if we're going to require businesses to shut their doors, um, and and you know, public health dictates that we do so, then we need to provide corresponding relief. Um, and that doesn't just have to come at the federal level, it can also come at the local levels. Um, and so that's something that we've been advocating for. There was a policy order a week ago in Cambridge that recommended that um, capacity at restaurants and music venues be, be diminished from 50 to 25%. Um, and, and we pushed back, we said, if that's gonna happen, there has to be corresponding relief that is offered to these businesses because um, Otherwise, they won't make it. They'll just close their doors permanently. And and it's not just what we try to remind our electeds is that it's not just businesses. These are people whose entire livelihoods are dependent on the revenue of these businesses, combined with um, the people that they employ. The you know around the country, small medium sized businesses employ fifty percent of working Americans. And so, it's um, it's not just the business owners, but the the often very vulnerable people who they employ um, who are often people of color. And so it's very closely connected to issues of race and racial justice. Um, so providing quick relief to businesses is something that we've advocated for. Um, we were really excited to see in Germany last fall, um, the German federal government 
did provide this kind of relief on a very intentional and systematic basis. So every business was given up to 75% of its revenues from the previous year when they were being forced to close. And this way they were able to continue payroll, continue supporting their staff and stay open despite mm -hmm. their short-term close closures. Um, so also there are ways that we can help businesses adapt and pivot. Um, by providing them with resources that will um, help them adapt more readily to um, to the changing landscape in which they find themselves. Um, so those are those are some. Um, I also think there's a really close connection to greener business practices. So identifying avenues for greater environmental um, sustainability for small businesses is something that we want to prioritize. Right. Great. Yeah. So one of the reasons why you've been able to to do so much in this space and and not just in the public policy space but in all of the other um work that that you've done at CLF and you know if we were going to take more time on it we could spend a lot of time talking about the the holiday guide and the other you know the the very extensive number of initiatives and programs and events and 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 everything that you guys put on uh, and because of the internship program that um, I play a small role in I get your calendar and a lot of your calendar invites, and I go, holy mackerel, they're they're doing another thing. <laughs> and then, and didn't they just have okay? Um, but so so, and we, you and I have talked a little bit on a on a previous interview last year about your process for managing. We kind of got into the nuts and bolts of how you yeah. you manage interns, and and you just you, you know you're you seem to resonate to kind of designing that kind of process. So it was, you know, it was so much fun to talk about that. And I'll, I'll link to that as well. But you also, you know, you've been very intentional about creating those kind of resources. Mm -hmm. So can we talk a little bit about the role that the resilient local economy interns have been playing in this work and kind of specifically what benefits you may be getting from having them do that versus you know board members or other random volunteers or you know yourself at yeah. two in the morning which you don't do which is probably why you can do all this other stuff so so Kind of, kind of help us understand what benefits there have been from from that that intern crew. Yeah, yeah, great question. Uh, so I can highlight some of the projects that our interns have done. I mean, it's it's pretty impressive. It's it's so exciting to see the breadth of projects that they've undertaken. Um, and so um, some of the projects that they've done um, include last fall. Our interns um, managed a um, Move Your Money campaign for the month of November. And one of those interns is now also managing our Move Your Money campaign for this upcoming May, um, which will amplify our community banking institutions. Um, can you, interns can you also managed. Briefly, sorry, can you explain briefly what Move Your Money is for folks yeah, who are sure. familiar with it? Yeah, Move Your Money is a campaign that a lot of independent business alliances do because financial institutions are a big part of the picture. So um, there has been multi-decade bank consolidation over the last 50 years, which means that now four banks control what thousands of banks used to control in terms of financial assets. And so this multi-decade bank consolidation has had many effects, but one of the effects is diminished resources devoted to small businesses because loans that are given to local businesses are generally not as um, fruitful as those that, that can be played with in other ways. And so um, part of why we've seen declining entrepreneurship in the United States over the last 50 years is that um, there has been uh, a decline in the number of, of community financial institutions that are the kinds of businesses that 
think that most give loans to small businesses. And there is also a real connection here to racial justice because community institutions are much more likely to give banks to um, to business owners of color and immigrant business owners. Um, those people are less likely to have um, connections to uh, larger banking institutions and, and also they're just far further down on their list of priorities. Um, and so this, this came up as an issue in the first round of PPP funding because it required um, a pre-existing relationship with the banker. Um, the banker had to help file the application and for a lot of uh, business owners of color, especially black business owners, they, they didn't have those banking relationships. And so something that we did as a an activity of our Move Your Money campaign in November was to, to have a, an event specifically geared toward black business owners um, to bolster banking relationships with our three primary uh, Cambridge area banks, Cambridge Savings Bank, Cambridge Trust Company, and East Cambridge Savings Bank. And these are also three organizations that invest very heavily in Cambridge Local First. Um, so part of why we're here today really is their support. I mean, they their support it helps lift up our organization tremendously. So that's that's Move Your Money. It's a it's a month long campaign that's focused on educating the public on why they should be uh, banking locally, why they should be moving their money to a local bank or or a credit union. So having students, and in this case, we're talking largely undergraduate students. This program has had some high school students coming from a Cambridge mm -hmm. relationship, and you know some master's, MBA, um, and some PhD students, the majority have been undergraduates. Mm -hmm. How are they able to, to help with this, these initiatives? And do you think those results are different from what you would be getting if you, you know, had a board member doing it or, um, you know, a volunteer who looked more like me? Yeah, I think... I mean, everyone brings their own resources and experiences to the table. I think our board members are, are better situated in fostering relationships because they are themselves business owners. And so they, they bring the experience of a business owner to the table. And so they have built relationships and, and a perspective that's very informed on the challenges that local businesses are facing and the kinds of interventions that we can make to be most helpful. So I find that our, our board members are able to provide strategic guidance um, in a way that our interns are generally not as well equipped to do. But interns who tend to be younger than our board members are um, very well suited to um, doing the work of design and social media and, and emails and, and facilitation. Like interns are able to do a lot of the work that um, helps move the diet, move things, move things forward. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that they play a different role, and volunteers are helpful as well. But there's a kind of accountability that I often find is more present in volunteer in interns, especially summer interns, because they've made a real commitment to this issue and to working in this space. Um, whereas with volunteers. Um, usually their assistance is less systematic and less sustained, although not always. We have some volunteers who've helped us on a, on a very long period. Um, and then of course, volunteers can become interns and volunteers can become staff um, and volunteers can become board members. So there's a, a huge amount of fluidity between the different roles that people play yeah. in the ecosystem. Yeah, and interns hopefully become board members yeah. and you know, yeah. volunteers yeah. as well. And occasionally, okay. so yeah. so to to wrap up a little bit as you look forward with um, let's go back to the public policy work um, to the the public policy initiative that Cambridge Local First is is spearheading. Um, mm -hmm. Where do you see that going in the next let's call it year or two years? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's hard to say because we're so we're really just beginning this path. Um, but I think what what I would love to see is Cambridge Local First as like just like ILSR is becoming a real voice for local businesses nationally. I'd love to see the city prioritize CLF 
when making any decision that impacts small businesses, because historically we are an afterthought and not a first thought, or or maybe we're thought about, but but not consulted directly. And so um, I'd love to see the city move in the direction of, of bringing in small businesses through Cambridge Local First as, as a primary vehicle for consultation whenever they're making a decision that has meaningful impact on small businesses. Um, because that has not happened to date. And I, and I think that everyone is worse off for that oversight. So I think, um, yeah, having real influence in the policy process and, and the city decision-making process where issues affect local businesses. Beautiful, beautiful. So if people want to learn more about Cambridge Local First, um, where should they go? Uh, www.cambridgelocalfirst.org. And when you go to that site, you'll mm -hmm. learn much more about this organization that I think is really one of the most forward thinking, um, certainly has been one of the most creative in terms of finding new ways to problem solve. And again, it, it's easy a lot of times for folks to say, oh, well, you know, they that's the Harvard people. And, you know, I have my little town, we don't have Harvard. So, you know, oh, I this is all, what does this have to do with, with my situation? But the extraordinary thing that I've seen um, just observing Cambridge Local First has been your ability to, to just find solutions. And it's not that they fall out of the tree to you because, oh, we're living in the land of, you know, brainiacs, mm -hmm. but you're going out and finding them and recruiting them and bringing solutions into the fold. And if from what I've seen, it's a variation on a theme. What Cambridge Local mm -hmm. First has been able to do is unique to Cambridge, but it's also, it's a process of leveraging what you've got available to you that every community has assets that it can leverage to advance its initiatives. And ISLR, and Michael Schumann's work, yeah. and the American Independent Business Alliance, these are all resources that are available to anyone. And yeah, absolutely. I think um, I, I would say that that all resonates. Um, we are, I think, learning how to be resourceful, learning how to identify resources, and also recognize that that partnerships are so helpful and and mutually beneficial. So for example, our internship program has been successful because interns also wanna connect with independent business alliances around the country. They don't just want, God bless you, they don't just wanna support Cambridge businesses, they wanna support all businesses. And so recognizing that we're stronger together. I also think that the um, Broadway show Hamilton, um, the song, uh, not th my shot where he says, um, hey, yo, I'm just like my country. I'm young, scrappy and hungry and I'm not throwing away my shot. I think that that <laughs> resonates a lot. We're, we're young, scrappy and hungry. Um, and we're we're trying to find resources that, you know, as, as they present themselves and take advantage of whatever opportunity comes our way. And young, scrappy and hungry is a great way to put it. I would also say that even for some of um, you can be scrappy and hungry and not necessarily be all that young either. So that's right. Um, that's right. But, but yeah, if, if, if I think scrappy and hungry is a huge piece of it and not throwing away your shot. That's an awesome, awesome <laughs> way to wrap this up. Anytime you could quote Hamilton. Hamilton, I know. <laughs> 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 well, I don't so, often get an opportunity to quote Hamilton. I was like, wait a second, this is a perfect reference. I have to bring it in. <laughs> <laughs> Work that one in there one way or another. Awesome. Well, Theo, thanks a ton. And thank you so much for, for spending the time talking. I could always talk to you all day, and and uh, but then you wouldn't get all that other good stuff done. All righty? So, thank cool. you. If you'll stay on for just one second yeah. after I, I shut off. Um, Sounds good. I, uh, 
again, just thank you so much for spending the time with me. Of and course. yeah. And I always tell folks that are listening and, and hopefully getting charged up and ready to be uh, hungry and scrappy and not throw away their shot. It, you know, yeah. now's the time to go get them. So thanks. Yeah. To speak the truth, frankly and boldly. Nor need we shrink from honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed effort to convert retreat into advance.
I'm honestly facing conditions in our country today. This great nation will endure as it has endured, will revive and will prosper. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Nameless, unreasoning, unjustified terror which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance.